and get started. Uh, thank you for coming to the talk. My name is John. Uh, you can find my Twitter handle up there as well as at the bottom of the slides. If you're interested in downloading the slides, I've already tweeted them out, so you can check out my Twitter. You can download the slides. Uh, I always like to start by giving a little bit of motivation, like why did I decide to make a presentation about debugging TLS and SSL? Uh, so it started out of a team retro. Uh, my, I work for a financial company, and the team was like, hey, we use a lot of TLS and SSL, but nobody knows how to debug it except for you. Can you, can you help, me, help us out with that? Uh, and that, you know, we run into all these different weird cases, and so like, I was like, okay, let's put together an internal presentation about debugging this. And uh, then I decided to you know, take it on the road, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I am not from Boston. Uh, I live in Chicago. I really do enjoy being in Boston, uh, so I was happy that I, my talk got accepted. Uh, I work for a company called Braintree. Uh, we help businesses take payments online, businesses like Uber and GitHub. Since I'm in Boston, I know at least one person out there is gonna be like, hmm, where did they come up with that name Braintree? Uh, it is from Braintree, Massachusetts. The founder of the company was a big fan of John Adams. Uh, if you aren't familiar though, Braintree was acquired by PayPal about two and a half years ago. So we're part of a very large financial company now. Uh, and if you ever work for a publicly traded company, you'll recognize this. These are my views, not that of my company. Please do not hold that against them. Jumping in real, uh, so what is TLS and SSL? Because they are two distinct things, even though we use them synonymously most of the time. When people say SSL, they usually mean TLS. Uh, so SSL is the original thing, the OG way to secure your connections is the secure sockets layer. Uh, TLS is the, is the new, new hotness, the transport layer security. Uh, but when we think about it from, you know, as a DevOps uh, engineering perspective or from a, you know, a developer security perspective, we think TLS in SSL means HTTPS, which means our users get a lock icon in the corner of their Chrome browser. Uh, a little history and background. Uh, SSL has been around for a while. Uh, back when Netscape, uh, and you actually had to buy uh, web servers from a company, like that was a thing uh, back in the day. Uh, Netscape was like, we're gonna do something crazy with this internet, and we're gonna like let people shop on it and stuff, but people want it to be secure, so they came up with SSL. Uh, you'll notice there's no SSL 1.0. The rumor I've always heard is that it was so horribly insecure and broken that they never actually released it publicly. Uh, so in 95, we got two and kept going to three. Uh, and then, uh, if, you know, if you remember anything from this era, you'll remember that there were two companies that did not like each other. One was Netscape, the other one was Microsoft. So Microsoft pushed for, hey, if we're gonna standardize this thing, it needs to be, we need to modify it a little bit and it can't have the name that they gave it. So it was handed over to the IETF and given the, the name TLS. And we've been working on that one for a while. You'll notice most recently, like hopefully everybody's using TLS 1.2 and we'll get into a little bit why. Uh, but that was 2008, so that's, you know, we're coming up on 10 years now. Uh, but TLS 1.3 is in draft and it'll fix a lot of the problems that have kind of lain dormant in TLS and SSL for a while. But what, you know, what is it, what are we, why do we even do it? Like why have a secure socket layer or a transport layer security? Uh, kind of breaking it down when, when I'm shopping online or when we're sending sensitive information around, like whether it be healthcare information or financial information, our users expect these three things. They expect confidentiality, which is uh, no one along the way should be able to read it uh, if, if they're not supposed to be reading it. They expect integrity, meaning nobody along the way can change things uh, if they're not, you know, without it being detected. And identification, we, we expect that if we go to amazon.com and put in our credit card number, that the browser has validated that I am actually talking to amazon.com and not some phishing website. Uh, and we do this uh, broadly with two types of cryptography. We have our symmetric cryptography where both sides share the key and our asymmetric uh, where each side has a different key. This is what we call public key cryptography. And public key cryptography is awesome. Uh, it solves the key distribution problem, which is like if I'm gonna talk to so, you, know, you and you're gonna talk to them and they're gonna talk to me, like we need to set up a key for each one of those and that's a giant hassle and it grows exponentially. Uh, so the development of public key cryptography would not, you know, without that, we would not be able to do any of this stuff. Uh, and 
The algorithms are based on hard math problems, meaning, you know, for example, RSA is if I take two prime numbers and multiply them together, uh, and they're very, very, very large, I should not be able to factor that back into those base primes. Uh, and we know that classical computers can't do this. Like, we know that, uh, try as you might, you can't build a supercomputer today that will be able to do that fast enough. Uh, and when we think about public key cryptography, it's really filling these two roles, the digital signatures or key exchange. For digital signatures, this is mostly what we're using, uh, at least for the part of TLS that we actually end up directly touching a lot of the time. Uh, and that allows us to share out a verifier key or a public key, uh, oftentimes in the form of a certificate, uh, and the person receiving that can use that to verify messages that you've signed. And what that means is that they can verify that the message hasn't been modified since it was signed, and that mathematically nobody else should have been able to make that signature without having the, the, the private part of that key. Uh, for key exchange, the reason we, we have uh, asymmetric crypto there is because, or is because uh, symmetric cryptography is far, far faster, like ridiculously much times faster. Uh, and it's built into our processors. Like you think about the AES instructions built into our, uh, our Intel chips. Uh, so we know that's really fast, and the asymmetric part's necessary, but it's really slow. So we use the asymmetric part just to set up a symmetric key, the key exchange, and then we go with the fast stuff later because we want our Amazon sessions to be as fast as possible. Uh, these are just some algorithms in the, in the you know, uh, alphabet soup that is the whole, in, you know, cryptography security realm, RSA, DSA, ECDSA. Uh, so if you ever see them later, you can reference back to the slides, like where they fall into this bucket. Uh, I'd like to take a second to talk a little bit about RSA security. So RSA security was a company uh, founded, I believe it was in the 80s, by the people who uh, actually created the RSA algorithm. There were two, or there were three professors, I think two are at MIT and one at Stanford, uh, and they decided to form a company to like build products around this and actually hold the patent on it, because uh, RSA was patented until September 2000, which you kind of think is like, wow, that's like right when everything took off, so like I wonder if that has anything to do with it. Uh, and uh, so they, they had this company. So this company was bought by EMC, which I believe is now owned by Dell. So it's kind of weird that like Dell owns this. Uh, so they came out with a few things called the Public Key Cryptography Standards, the PKCS, because it's like, hey, we have this entirely new field. Nobody is using it because we don't have standards for it. Like nobody knows how to write, write software for it. Um, but RSA security came around and like, we're gonna standardize this, we're gonna come up with this, you know, things for people to use. Uh, and they did, decided to make this choice to rely on something called the ASN1 format, uh, which is now prevalent everywhere because of this. Uh, ASN1 is abstract syntax notation one, in case we needed more than one abstract syntax notation. We had it, uh, we had it versioned from the beginning. Uh, and it describes a tree structure. I like to think of this as like, really old XML, it's like, that's what it is. It was used to describe a tree structure in a file. And uh, it wasn't abstract enough because they ended up coming with different ways that you can represent it, uh, including a binary format called Distinguishing Coding Rules, or DIR. And the reason I mention this is because this is what you almost always run into. Uh, and the reason why this is important is because it allows you to canonically, so if I give everybody the same tree, all these computers will come up with the exact same bits on disk, which is really important in cryptography because everything has to match up perfectly bit by bit. Uh, so we use this distinguishing coding rules. But we don't really typically, we actually almost always use PIM files or privacy enhanced mail. So privacy enhanced mail never really caught on, but the standard they came up with uh, did. Uh, and this is the, basically you open up a certificate or a key and you see a base 64 encoded blob that's a PIM file, uh, and it, what it is is that is just Base64 encoded D, DIR data uh, that has had headers uh, append, appended in, you know, a header and footer added to it, just so that, you know, we mere mortals can read it, and it was also really easy to mail around because it would use the, only the seven-bit character set. Uh, this is the preferred format for OpenSSL, which means it's probably the format you're mostly going to use unless you're a Java shop. Uh, the, the problem I, uh, first problem I run into is when I, I hand someone a file uh, that has something in it, 
you really can't necessarily always tell what's in that file because we didn't do a great job establishing file exten extensions. So you'll see things with like .pim or .dr, and that describes the format of the file, but not what it contains. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily tell you that it contains a certificate or a key or whatever. Or you may have something that ends in .crt or .key, but it doesn't tell you what it's encoded as. So it could be a pim file, it could be a dir file. Uh, and I find this incredibly confusing, uh, and I imagine I'm not alone in that. Uh, Talk about OpenSSL, we uh, love it or hate it, OpenSSL is the, like, kind of the de facto that uh, we use. Uh, it was this uh, person by the name Eric Young wrote it. The, word, the rumor in the, in the history of computing is that he wrote it to learn, teach himself C, uh, which is always a punchline of a joke about the security of OpenSSL. Uh, but he wrote SSL EAY, which is his initials. Uh, and then it got forked into OpenSSL when he went to work for RSA Security, which directly competed with this. Uh, and it is by far still the most popular library. And uh, for the rest of this, I want to talk about like, what are the common problems that I, I've seen, uh, including files in the wrong format, servers and SNI, and uh, intermediate certificates, and uh, insecure and default settings. So uh, let's talk first about working with key files. Uh, if you want to generate, uh, I'm going to skip through some of these because you can always reference the slides later, and it's more just to get the thing in the slide for you to reference later. So we can generate uh, an RSA key file from OpenSSL. It'll do its thing and figure out some large prime numbers for us to use. Uh, and by default, OpenSSL is going to dump out something for RSA that's in something called PKCS1 format. So this was the original standard for RSA. Uh, describes only the storage of RSA keys in a file, uh, and it still haunts us to this day because this is what OpenSSL prefers. Uh, when you look at it, it's the thing that says begin RSA private key. And the, part, the fact that it says RSA in the header is the important part. That's what makes it different from the other things. You can use OpenSSL to dump out the text. Uh, there's the part of the modulus, but you can always, uh, OpenSSL has really great introspection utilities if you actually dig down into it. Uh, something I use a lot is a tool called ASN1Parse. So uh, this, if you give it a file, um, by default it thinks it's gonna get a PIM file, but you can tell it that it'll be a dir file. Uh, it'll actually walk the tree and dump out the tree for you uh, of everything that's in there. So if you're like really down in the dumps, like you can actually see how it's gonna parse the tree out into the data. And as you can see, this RSA PKCS1 file is just a bunch of integers that are encoded in the file. Uh, so eventually we had more, more crypto standards than just RSA. So the government for a long time was all about DSA or the digital signature algorithm. Uh, and now we have elliptic curve DSA. And so they, uh, they, they expanded this and they're like, okay, we can't use PKCS1 anymore because it only describes RSA keys. Uh, we're gonna now have this new format, PKCS8, that can describe any type of key. Uh, and you can easily convert between the two if you need to. Uh, because you'll be interacting with Java or something and it won't read as something that's not in a PKCS8 format. Uh, the key here is when you look at the file, it now long, no longer says begin uh, RSA private key, it just says begin private key or begin public key. Uh, and that is because when you parse it out, uh, they've actually encoded the type of key in the tree structure. So it's like a it's uh, essentially an enumeration of all the different types of keys and they have that one in there. And that basically describes like, hey, this uh, object of bytes that comes later, here's what this is. It's an RSA encryption object or an RSA key. Uh, uh, so this is just another thing like, hey, if you actually uh, encode a PIM into DR format, you can dump it out and it's a bunch of bits. It doesn't actually read. So if you dump that out to the terminal, you'd probably be fumbling to type reset. Working with certificates. So uh, you have your keys, which are the first part, and, uh, but they're not very useful without the public part or the certificates. This is just, you know, hey, you can look, uh, this is a PKCS uh, encoded file, or sorry, it's a PIM encoded file of an X509 certificate, I caught myself. Uh, and the reason you can tell it's PIM encoded is because it's base64 encoded and it has that very descriptive header. Uh, so I, I caught myself because X509 is actually completely different from PKCS. Uh, X509 is a, 
It's a standard that, like, if you're familiar with the X standards, like X400, X500, it was like this committee got together and they were like, well, we, we need, we're gonna do everything. And like, eventually they got to the part where like, we need to do public key cryptography to like, keep things secure. And so they have a whole, like, they had a whole group that went off and did this. And like, that's really the only part of that whole standards body that has like, lived around till today is this, is the X509 standards. Uh, and they came up with a format for uh, describing digital certificates. Of course, they used ASN1 because that's what everybody was using in the crypto world back then. Uh, certificates uh, almost always wrap a public key, so essentially they're just a public key from uh, that you know that you can give out broadly, and there are some metadata that is wrapped, uh, and then they're signed by by whatever the issuer of the certificate would be. Um, uh, and certificates have a lifetime, so that's that's another thing that often bites people. They uh, you know, you put the certificate up there and then a year later you forget to update it and you're running around because support's telling you that uh, nobody can get to the website. Uh, you can view this, the uh, certificate, so X509 for, to the OpenSSL has a really great text feature. This is probably the thing in uh, the OpenSSL command line tool that I use the most, just to like look at, hey, when's this certificate on disk going to expire? Uh, we used to have, um, Nagios that would check this, so that, like we would get an alert whenever, uh, so we would know to rotate the certificates. Uh, X509 importantly has extensions. Uh, some of the really important ones are CA. So CA determines whether or not you can be an issuer. If you're CA false, you can't be an issuer. If you're CA true, you can be. Clearly, it's really important that the wrong people don't get to be CAs because that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, they also have key usage uh, and extended key usage. And if these are not correct, certain things will just fail silently. Uh, OpenSSL will fail silently, browsers will fail silently, and you won't really know why, and you'll scratch your head for a while, and you'll be like, well, this certificate that worked had key usage, and this certificate that didn't does not have key usage. And that's, uh, that's because sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. And when it matters, uh, you'll scratch your head as to why it stopped working. Uh, all right, so uh, you can't have a certificate without a certificate request, generally. Uh, so a certificate request is sent to a CA, contains the public key for the certificate, and the requester also signs it to kind of show that they have control of that private key. Uh, you can use OpenSSL to generate one. Uh, you can also dump out uh, a certificate request. It looks a lot like an X509 certificate, just with a couple fields nulled out. Uh, and what I have generally found is that CAs, for the most part, do not care about anything in this file except for the public key. This is merely a vessel to get them the public key. Uh, and then next, uh, PKCS12, because we didn't have enough file formats. Uh, so PKCS12 kind of fit, uh, kind of grew out of this thing in Windows where they're like, we essentially need a zip file that has keys and certificates and is password protected, so let's make a file format for that. And they started using it and they called it PFX and then the standardization committee was like, all right, that's kind of cool, so we'll standardize that as PKCS12. Uh, this is the preferred format for Windows if you're in that world. And finally, if you're in the Java world, uh, Java, of course, also has its own format. Uh, so Java has their key stores, very similar to a PKCS12 file, allows you to combine multiple types of things. And if you're in the Java ecosystem, you've probably run into this a few times. When we're debugging connections, uh, so, I, so this is beyond the layer of like, I can make a TCP handshake to the thing. Like, I, I actually have a TCP stream. Now I can debug what happens after that. Uh, I always reach for curl. First thing, reach for curl, give it the dash V flag. Uh, this is often how I find that some internal service didn't, has, a, uh, has a certificate that's expired or something like that. Like, you, you can find out a lot with just curling the endpoint, and it'll tell you like what certificates it sees, what uh, cipher it's negotiated, all that stuff. Uh, next up, I reach for OpenSSL S client. So OpenSSL has these really great tools. S client is just, essentially you can think of it as Telnet, only it will negotiate TLS first and then drop you into a terminal where you can start typing away. So you could manually type your HTTP request there, just like you would with Telnet to port 80. Uh, OpenSSL, uh, it dumps out a whole lot of uh, information. It also has uh, S server, which allows you to spin up a, a TLS server if you need to like hit something real quick. You can think of that almost like Netcat 
with uh, the dash L flag. So you can think of it as like, I just need a server that will dump out whatever it receives. Something to know about SS OpenSSL is it doesn't ship with root certificates. This sometimes uh, confuses people because they, they expect, hey, this thing's an SSL library, why doesn't it have root certificates? And that's because they don't view that as their, their space. Uh, they prefer that the operating system do this or the brow and the browsers do it. So on Linux, your distro will probably ship with uh, roots that came from Mozilla. On OS X, the version of uh, OpenSSL is especially patched to fall back to the uh, OS X uh, keychain store. Also, the version of OpenSSL on OS X is super old, like super, super old. Don't use it. Uh, Next, next thing I uh, reach for is SSLIs. Uh, this is a really great tool that will kind of like show you a bunch of information about like, hey, here are all the ciphers we supported and things, and you can, uh, it's a command line tool, so you can run this behind your bastion host or whatever for internal services. Uh, dump out like, hey, this certificate would be in these uh, CA stores if you care for, about that thing. Uh, almost always reach for Wireshark at some point. Uh, you can dump the PCAP file out and look later. Wireshark has really great uh, introspection utilities to kind of like dig into what's going on with the TLS session. Uh, SSL Labs, so if you're trying to hit something that is exposed to the public, SSL Labs is an amazing thing. It's kind of like SSLIs on steroids, but of course it's a service so it can only hit public things. Uh, they'll grade your, your setup, so I r highly recommend if you have a public website that serves uh, SSL or TLS, have them grade your setup. Uh, you may be surprised. They do an amazing job. They also tell you like what obscure OpenSSL patch you may be missing or things like that. Uh, how TLS works, uh, TLS is, has its own complicated handshake process uh, and it jumps through a bunch of different phases. Uh, starts with client hello, it's very polite protocol. Uh, the protocol, it, the client specifies, hey, here's the protocol I want, uh, the ciphers I support, and then the extensions. The one that people really care about is what's called server name indication. Uh, server na name indication allows the client to tell what server they want to talk to, and this is important because until the TLS handshake has occurred, your HTTP headers aren't sent, so your web server doesn't know what vhost to direct it to. Uh, and so this has, was the bane of shared hosts for a very long time because you had to have a dedicated IP address to serve TLS until server name indication came along. Unfortunately, this support is still not 100%. Like old Python, old Java don't support it. Almost all browsers do, but if you have people running into problems, they may be something like that. Uh, server responds back, says, hey, I'm this server, here's my certificate. Uh, or here's my, my, the stuff I chose for you. And then it also says, here's my certificate. Uh, there's this whole phase for client certificates, which uh, I'm not gonna jump into, but uh, is, you know, there's this whole place where you can negotiate those if you're using client certificates. Um, and then finally, the, uh, they send along, all right, it's time to end the handshake and start encrypting stuff. So this is the finished message, and then after that, data will be encrypted. So that whole, that whole stuff is not encrypted. Take a minute to talk about TLS verification and how people are probably doing it wrong. Uh, there was a paper a few years ago called The Most Dangerous Code in the World, uh, which looked at mostly like phone apps and client libraries and stuff like that, so non-browser software, and they found that a lot of them were doing things incorrectly, uh, and they weren't validating uh, SSL. This, uh, if you don't know, Ryan is the, I think he's the security lead at Slack. Uh, Yes, I, I would be surprised if that was happening, but this is your internet of shit, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, first, the first part of TLS verification you need to know is that there's a chain of trust. Uh, this Sarah from, uh, yeah, I put this in, yeah, uh, we are at speaker dinner, and she's like, this is the best description I ever saw of it. Uh, so I, I did like this. So Ensign Tony, we don't trust this, this person at all. They, look, they have a red shirt. Uh, but uh, but we, we, of course, trust Captain Picard. Uh, and he trusts Jordy, so, and we know Jordy trusts Instant Tony, so this is the chain of trust, and this is how, so Picard is the certificate authority in this case, so uh, I really like this, this is a really good way to describe it, so this is how we can trust Instant Tony. Uh, the next step, the uh, thing that people miss, so the, so the problem with doing that is sometimes people don't check that, they like don't even check who they're, the, do the math to check that. The next one is they don't do the, the hostname verification check, 
Uh, I kind of think of this as like when the cashier asks for my, uh, I give them my credit card, they ask for my ID, if they just look at it and don't actually validate that the two names are the same, uh, I think of that as like hostname verification. Uh, so if you're not doing hostname verification, you're getting a certificate back, that certificate chains correctly and I trust it, but uh, I don't actually check the host name that's provided by it. This happens a lot more than you would think. And what that means is I can just go to like Let's Encrypt and get a valid certificate and then intercept your connections. Uh, and the reason why, open, so OpenSSL doesn't do this by default. That's, that's part of it, because hostname is protocol dependent, uh, meaning that like HTTP does it different than SMTP, uh, and so each library is supposed to build their own, but if you're using a really dumb library or you're doing it yourself, you may not be checking the hostname. Uh, the next thing is people are always like, hey, I, like SSL Labs is yelling at me, or I don't know how to configure my TLS server. Mozilla has a really great website, uh, that you just plug in, like I'm using Nginx in this version of OpenSSL, and it will dump out the config file for you of like, here's what we recommend you use, and they have really great options. So uh, with that, I will take a few minutes of questions. I have four minutes for questions, and I, I did have some bonus content that you can check on the slides later. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>